When Britain found itself at war in 1939, RAF's Bomber Command had three frontline bombers at its disposal. There was the slab-sided Handley Page Hampton, there was the geodetic-framed Vickers Wellington, and there was the Armstrong Whitworth Whitley, which is the focus of today's video. Both the Hampton and the Wellington were in service as daytime medium bombers, though the former was technically only a medium bomber in name due to its small size. The Whitley, on the other hand, was designed from the outset as a heavy night bomber, replacing the aging Vickers Virginia, the slightly confused Handley Page Hayford, and the innovative but rubbish Fairy Hendon. Out of the three, the Hampton, the Wellington, and the Whitley, the Wellington was by far the most successful, and the most famous. The Hampton is well known because of its unique and cramped design, but the Whitley has remained almost criminally obscure, despite the fact that the aircraft itself was perfectly capable, and quite successful in its intended roles. Today's video will hopefully address this, and much like other long videos which focus on World War II aircraft, we'll cover the development of the Whitley first, and then take a look at its service history. Like some other British warplane designs of the 1930s, the Whitley was a victim, not only of political restraint, but more importantly of the rapid advances being made in aviation technology during this period. Its design was first drawn up in 1934, it first flew in 1936, but within the space of another year or so it was already halfway to becoming obsolete. Newer designs, such as the promising Hanley Page Halifax, the Short Stirling, and the Avro Manchester were already in development. Though the latter, as it turned out, was only promising on paper, and in reality was more troublesome than a slightly intoxicated honey badger. But despite the imminent arrival of these newer designs, the Whitley would still be produced in large numbers and see widespread use and this was mostly due to decisions that were made in the halls of government several years before the outbreak of the Second World War. Though conceived in 1934, we need to go back to 1932 to understand the political factors that influenced the design and production of the Armstrong Whitworth Whitley. In 1932, the Geneva Disarmament Conference was held, running on for the next two years, and one of the matters brought forward was the limiting, or even the outright banning, of aerial bombing. At the time, many thought that in the span of a matter of years, the world could risk a destruction if the development of bomber aircraft went unchecked, a sentiment that was echoed in views on nuclear proliferation later on in the 1950s and 1960s. Many within the British government were in favour of the numerous proposals made during this conference, and although it would eventually amount to a giant waste of time, the Air Ministry was forced to issue stringent weight requirements for their new bombing aircraft specifications. This resulted in specification B9-32, which led to the development of the Handley Page Hampton and the Vickers Wellington, and the saga of which was covered in each of their own videos already on this channel, so if you want to learn more about that, I recommend checking out those videos as well. Following the collapse of support for the convention, the British government then initiated a rearmament program, directing the Air Ministry to issue a string of specifications to both modernise and strengthen the RAF. One of these was specification B3-34. This called for a twin-engine heavy night bomber, which could also carry out day bombing as well if sufficient cloud cover was available. Some of the requirements of the specification were as follows. The bomb load was to be at least 2,500 pounds. The bomber should be capable of carrying the new 1,500 pound bombs then being developed. Wingspan was to be limited to 100 feet so that it could fit within the existing dimensions of RAF hangars. The bomber was to have an operational range of 1,250 miles. It was to have a top speed of at least 225 miles an hour at 15,000 feet. The crew complement was to consist of five, and there should be defensive positions in the nose, tail, and amidships, mounting 30 caliber machine guns. This new specification was issued to four aircraft manufacturers, Armstrong Whitworth, Ferry, Hanley Page, and Vickers. 
The four companies then met with the M Ministry in August to further discuss the specification. Some alterations were made owing to concerns about the capabilities of the main power plants available at the time. The Air Ministry absolutely refused to reduce the total bomb load, and so compromises had to be made when it came to the aircraft's performance. The maximum speed was reduced to just 205 miles an hour, and while the bomb load did remain the same, the requirement to carry the 1500 pound bomb design was dropped. Things then stalled at the place where most military equipment discussions tended to stall – money. The purse strings of the Ministry were not particularly elastic during this time, but the projected development costs of the new bomber would require a considerable outlay. No agreement could be made on the budget for prototype development, and due to the pressing needs of the RAF, the Air Ministry made an irregular decision. They put aside the proposals from Ferry, Hanley Page and Vickers, and in June of 1935 issued a single contract for Armstrong Whitworth, charging them to produce a prototype of their design proposal, the AW38 Whitley. This was something of a gamble, as the usual process was to have at least two competing prototypes being built, in case one was a complete disaster. But by giving Armstrong Whitworth sole priority, it would speed up the process of getting a new heavy bomber into service, as there would be no risk of evaluation delays should any competing designs run into development problems, and in the past this had sometimes caused serious delays. Construction of the AW38 prototype took approximately 9 months, with the aircraft being completed in March of 1936. Owing to the rapidly worsening political situation in Europe, and the rest of the world in general, the Whitley was actually ordered into production long before this prototype would even make its maiden flight. 80 were ordered in August of 1935, and this was followed by another order for 240 in May of the following year. When first rolled out, the Whitley prototype was not exactly an aesthetically pleasing aircraft. It had thick wings, angular lines here, there and everywhere, and the profile of its nose gave it the elegance of a brick. But its designer, John Lloyd, had given it considerable thought. It shared some design features with the AW23, another aircraft already covered on this channel. Notably, it inherited the wings, albeit with a slightly shorter span and a different mounting, as well as the tailplane design and the use of a retractable undercarriage, the latter of which was still considered a modern innovation for military aircraft, though they were already seeing widespread use with commercial transports. In terms of construction, the prototype was a considerable breakaway from previous Armstrong Whitworth designs, and it was something of a novelty, being the first aircraft with a stressed metal skin fuselage to go into production for the RAF. The construction of the Whitley's fuselage broke the company's tradition of using tubular steel construction, something that they had favoured since the development of the all-metal version of the Siskin. The Whitley's fuselage was made from a light alloy monocoque which was covered by a stressed skin of sheet metal. This was flush riveted to longitudinal stringers which were supported by curved open section framing. This meant that although it looked like a slab sided flying box, the Whitley's fuselage was in fact curved, and looking at its cross section from the front, it more resembled a slightly squished barrel. The fuselage was built in three sections a nose section, a centre section built integral with the central section of the wing, and a rear section at the tailplane. The large wing was also built in three sections. It consisted of a large, light alloy box bar of corrugated sheet metal, which was internally braced with a structure of steel tubes, or struts. Most of the wing was also covered with sheet metal as well, like the fuselage, but the sections aft of the spar, including the control surfaces, was still covered in fabric. Now the design of this wing, or more specifically its orientation, is what made the Whitley stand apart from its contemporaries. The use of flaps for takeoff and landing was gradually becoming more common in both commercial and military aviation, but some manufacturers had more experience than others. John Lloyd and his design team had practically no experience with them when the Whitley had first been proposed, 
and although they would certainly be useful in getting a heavy bomber to lift its bulk into the skies, he omitted their use as the team was under immense time pressure, and any delays due to design complications would be received poorly by the Air Ministry. To keep the landing speeds low, lest the Whitley overshoot its runway into such things as fences, hedges, ditches, houses, and other things which didn't make for a comfortable or safe landing spot, the wing was designed with a sharp angle of incidence of 8.5 degrees. This would provide the necessary lift for takeoff and the necessary drag for landing, but it did present something of an interesting characteristic when it came to level flight. The Whitley would have to fly with its nose pointed down in order to fly level, and when done at low altitude, this did make for a rather alarming sight, albeit a perfectly safe one. Unsurprisingly, this flight profile was not the most efficient use of the airframe, and as the fuselage was not presenting the smallest possible frontal profile, and as the wings were already quite thick, the increased drag had a profoundly negative effect on fuel consumption. Despite this drastic attempt to get around the use of flap systems, flaps would in fact be added into the design before the prototype had even flown. Unfortunately, the wing profile by this point had been baked in, as they say, and changing it would cost too much time and money. And so, the Whitley would go into production with both flaps and the heavily angled wings. As planned, the Whitley was designed to carry a crew of five. A pilot, a second pilot who also acted as the navigator, a bomb aimer who also served as the nose gunner, a wireless operator, and a tail gunner. Initially, the Whitley was defended by just two 303 caliber Vickers machine guns, each mounted in manually operated Armstrong Whitworth turrets. Even by the conservative standards of the time, this was a pitiful show of force, but unlike other bombers being developed during this time, the Air Ministry wanted the Whitley to operate solely at night. Many senior officials held optimistic views about the ineffectiveness of night fighters and the slow development of compact airborne radar systems, and because of this, the few people that called for an increase in the Whitley's defences found themselves stonewalled, at least for the time being. When it came to offensive armament, the prototype Whitley, which, as mentioned before, had already been committed to production orders before it had even flown, showed much greater promise. It could carry up to 2,000 pounds of bombs within its bomb bay, which ran from beneath the cockpit to the wing trailing edge, and the immense thickness of the wings permitted the installation of internal bomb cells. This enabled the Whitley to carry an additional six 250-pound bombs or 12 112-pound bombs, for a total carrying capacity of approximately 3,500 pounds. Though nothing like the bomb loads seen in larger designs during the Second World War, this was still enough to firmly class the Whitley as a heavy bomber in the mid to late 1930s, and this was further confirmed by its predicted loaded weight of 21,000 pounds. Owing to this heavy weight, a new retractable undercarriage had been designed. It featured Lockheed designed actuating jacks, shock absorbing legs, and chunky Dunlop wheels which retracted up into the engine nacelles. Like many designs of this period, the wheels themselves were not completely tucked away, with a portion sticking out below to take the worst of the impact out of a potential wheels up landing. Along with the new undercarriage, the Whitley also featured newly developed three-blade, two-position, variable-pitch propellers, another first for RAF military aircraft, and these would be driven by the Armstrong Sidley Tiger 9, which was a 14-cylinder radial engine that produced approximately 795 horsepower. Fuel, totaling 519 gallons, was carried in three tanks – two located in the leading edge of the wings, and another over the wing centre section in the top of the fuselage. All up, and with a full bomb load, this was expected to give the Whitley a range of 1500 miles, though this could be extended at the cost of a reduced bomb load. In summary, the prototype, when completed, looked quite promising, which was all the more reassuring as the Air Ministry had already placed orders, and it made its maiden flight on the 17th of March 1936. 
Early flights were made without incident, and after it made its first public appearance at the RAF display at Hendon, it was sent on to Martlesham Heath for its official service trials. Though it was an improvement over the previous generation of heavy bombers, the Whitley's performance was not as good as expected. Although no major problems or incidents occurred during the service trials, the Whitley was only able to achieve a top speed of 197 miles an hour at 7,000 feet, which was below the Air Ministry's minimum requirements. Additionally, fuel consumption was higher than expected, and it took just over 15 minutes to climb to just 10,000 feet. Again, this was an improvement over previous designs, but it fell short of what the Air Ministry wanted. Despite falling below some expectations, at least as far as performance went, the Whitley was overall reviewed quite favourably. Its handling was praised by test pilots, who noted that it was particularly easy to take off and land. The combination of landing flaps and the high incidence angle wings meant that the heavy Whitley had a landing speed of just 63 miles an hour. Its takeoff run was less than 900 feet, and with the correct use of wheel brakes, its landing run could be as short as 630 feet. All of these were traits that would soon make the Whitley a very popular aircraft with the night flying squadrons. The Whitley's slow speed had not been wholly unexpected, and before the prototype first flew, work had already begun on a second. This was powered by a supercharged version of the Tiger 9, which had an increased output of 935 horsepower, and it first flew in February of 1937. The improved engines pushed the top speed to 205 miles an hour, allowing the type to be deemed officially acceptable for the Air Ministry specification, even though several production models were by this point already built, and the first Whitleys were accepted by the RAF in early March. The first production model, the Mark I, was almost identical to the first prototype. It retained the Armstrong Whitworth designed turrets and the original 795 horsepower Tiger 9 engines. Because of this, these early Whitleys, first becoming operational with No. 10 Bomber Squadron on March the 9th, didn't technically meet the Air Ministry's official requirements. However, they were still a big upgrade compared to the Hayford biplanes, which had barely been in service for a few years. In total, only 34 of the Mark I Whitleys would be produced, and while they were technically frontline units, many of them weren't actually fit to be so. On the one hand, many found themselves being used for additional exhaustive testing, which often resulted in the bombing crews falling behind in operational experience, and on the other hand, many of these Whitleys weren't actually fit for frontline service as they lacked any kind of defensive armament. A shortage of the Armstrong Whitworth turrets meant that only the first 12 of the Mark I Whitleys were actually delivered with their defensive guns. The others, for the most part, came with these positions fared over by a few millimetres of sheet metal. Thankfully, this being 1937, the RAF was not yet at war, and this embarrassing lack of defensive firepower wasn't too much of an immediate problem, apart from causing severe bouts of boredom for the tail gunner. Now, this glaring problem was eventually fixed, but unhappily sources conflict on how exactly this came about, so we'll take these facts with a grain of salt. On the whole, it appears that some of the Whitleys eventually got their originally intended turrets, but others were equipped with early versions of various Fraser Nash turrets. Specifically, the tail would use the early version of the FN-10, which mounted two Vickers K-guns, and the nose would use the FN-16, which had a single gun. These were very well received by the crew, as the Fraser Nash turrets were hydraulically powered as opposed to the hand-cranked Armstrong Whitworth models, which were proving to be painfully difficult to operate when the Whitley approached its service ceiling of 19,000 feet. These turret changes were partly carried on into the Whitley Mark II, and indeed, depending on what source you read, they may have begun first with the Mark II and then had the changes made to the Mark I retroactively. The 27th production Mark I was selected as the prototype, and the main thing that set the Marks apart was the new power plant. The Mark II Whitley was powered by the Armstrong Sidley Tiger 8, which produced 845 horsepower, 
it now made use of a two-speed supercharger. And, in fact, the Whitley was the first service aircraft to make use of such a device. The result was a modest improvement in performance across the board. Top speed increased to 215 miles an hour at 15,000 feet. The climb to 15,000 feet was reduced by approximately 4 to 5 minutes, and the aircraft service ceiling was slightly increased. Like the Mark I, the production run for the Mark II was relatively short, with just 46 being produced before things moved on to the Mark III. This was because the design choices that led to the Mark III had in fact been made before the first Mark I's had fully entered service. As the type had been ordered off the drawing board, many things were bound to change between the placing of the first contracts and the eventual time where Whitley's would be entering service in numbers. This meant that many of the first 200 Whitley's to enter RAF service varied widely in performance, capabilities, and even their shape. It was a trade-off that the Air Ministry was willing to accept in order to get more bombers into service as quickly as possible, and fortunately, the Whitley's production run would become standardised before the outbreak of the war in Europe. The Mark III Whitley was a significant upgrade, and many of its improvements were the result of a new specification, B-20-36, which had been drawn up to consolidate various design changes. These changes included the addition of four degrees of dihedral to the outer wing to improve climb and high altitude performance, a change which was then retroactively applied to the Mark I and Mark II as well. A new camouflage pattern was selected, one more suited to nighttime flying, which included the underside being painted in all black. A lavatory was now provided, whose absence had been a cause for concern on long-range flights, and an updated instrument panel was installed in the cockpit. Along with these upgrades, the offensive and defensive capabilities of the Whitley had likewise been improved. Two improvements could be found in the bomb bay. Firstly, racks were installed to take the new 2,000-pound high-explosive bombs, which, when combined with the wing cells, took the bomb load up to 5,500 pounds. And secondly, there was an improvement to the bomb bay itself. To save on weight, and to reduce complexity, earlier versions of the Whitley did not have hydraulically powered bomb bay doors. They were instead held shut by bungee cords, and their function was frighteningly simple. During a bombing run, the live, highly explosive bombs would be released from their racks and thump onto the bomb bay doors, once with such volume that a crew member apparently privately crossed himself. The doors would then begrudgingly yield to their weight, and then snap back into place once the bombs had made their exit. Unsurprisingly, this made the mostly inaccurate results of pre-war level bombing even more inaccurate, as the exact timing of bombs clearing the aircraft was more or less impossible to determine, and long before the Mark III had even been built, somebody had already made tacit remarks that a spring-loaded bomb bay was complete lunacy, and hydraulic doors were thus used instead. Along with improvements to its offensive capabilities, the Whitley's defensive firepower had also been increased. This was both a response to feedback given by RAF pilots, and the worsening political situation in Europe, which was hastening further rearmament of Britain's air forces. The original Armstrong Whitworth tail turret was retained, as a new model by Fraser Nash was not yet ready, but the FN-10 became the standard nose turret, and the Mark III Whitley would also feature the FN-17, also known as a dustbin turret. Like the FN-9 turrets that were trialled on Vickers Wellingtons, this was an attempt to widen the aircraft's defensive field of fire, particularly in the lower rear quarter. Though the Mark III Whitley was the first to make use of such a device, the Mark I and Mark II had both been designed with this in mind, and the circular hole in the bottom of the fuselage had simply been covered by a metal plate. But, like with those used on the Vickers Wellington, the Whitley's dustbin turrets proved to be highly unpopular, and were, in general, not particularly good. They added over half a tonne to the aircraft's total weight, and when deployed they created a huge amount of drag, reducing the aircraft's top speed and completely deafening the poor gunner who was strapped inside. 
As a result, the Mark III would be the only variant to use this turret, and even then, some of them were removed by their crews once the aircraft had been delivered to the squadron. In total, approximately 80 of these dustbin model Mark III Willys were produced, with the last being delivered in March of 1939, before things moved on to the Mark IV. This variant was a significant departure for Armstrong Whitworth, as it was not powered by an engine of their own design. Though it had met the Air Ministry's speed requirements, it was still felt that the Whitley was too slow, particularly when it came to its climb rate. The design team had begun looking for a solution to this problem as far back as 1936, before the first Whitleys had even left the factory. To gain more than a modest increase in performance, an engine of at least 1,000 horsepower would have to be installed. Initially, a potential solution appeared in the form of the Bristol Pegasus 20, which might be induced to produce 1,000 horsepower, but this was then quickly abandoned in favour of a far more promising engine that had recently emerged, the Rolls-Royce Merlin. An early Mark I Whitley was lent to Rolls-Royce in early 1938, and on the 11th of February, it took to the skies powered by a pair of 990 horsepower Merlin IIs. At the experimental establishment at Boscombe Down, it achieved a top speed of 239 miles an hour at 16,000 feet, but it was sent back to Rolls-Royce owing to complaints about engine noise and heating problems. Owing to the promising performance, two more Mark I Whitleys were quickly loaned out, each to test more advanced versions of the Merlin, and by the end of the year, the teething problems had been solved, and the Merlin-powered Whitley Mark IV was officially placed into production. Equipped with 1,030 horsepower Merlin IVs, the Whitley now had a top speed of 245 miles an hour at 16,000 feet, and a significantly improved cruising speed. Fuel tankage was also increased, with an extra pair of 93-gallon tanks installed in the wings, and this meant that it now had a normal cruising range of 1,250 miles. Or, with an extra tank in place of a 2,000-pound bomb, the range could go up to 1,800 miles. Another important change was the complete change of the defensive guns to be powered by the Fraser Nash turrets, with the nose now mounting two 303 caliber machine guns, and the tail had a new FN-20 turret which mounted four. And at the time, this was the heaviest rear-firing armament to be equipped on any bomber in service. Another small but noticeable change could also be found in the nose. The old bomb aiming panel had been removed, and a plexiglass chin extension took its place, something that became common across many RAF frontline bombers from 1938 moving forward. Though a big improvement, only 44 Mark IV Whitleys would be produced before things moved on to the penultimate version, the Mark V. The Mark V was born from efforts to improve the battleworthiness of the Whitley between 1937 and mid-1938, a period that saw the likelihood of a new war in Europe grow significantly. The main features of the Mark V included the extension of the rear fuselage beyond the tail surfaces to give the rear gunner a better field of fire, and the switch to the more powerful 1145 horsepower Merlin 10. This engine was also fitted to some of the last Mark IVs on the production line, and these were then known as the Mark IVA. Other improvements on the Mark V included redesigned vertical tail surfaces, de-icing boots on the wing leading edge, and an increased fuel capacity, which now sat at 837 gallons. The combined increase of engine power and fuel load also allowed the bomb load to be improved as well. The Whitley could now carry up to 7,000 pounds of bombs, two 2,000 pound bombs in the bomb bay, with the rest being held within enlarged and redesigned wing cells. With this increased capacity, the Whitley was finally shaping into something that resembled a heavy bomber, at least compared to the modest examples that came before. But the first of these new aircraft were not delivered until August of 1939. A month later, when Britain found itself at war with Germany, the RAF had just 196 Whitleys on strength, and almost all of these were the older and less capable models. There were 32 Mark 1s, 43 Mark 2s, 
76 Mark III's, 33 Mark IV's, 7 Mark IV A's, and just 5 Mark V's. This mixed bag was operated by numbers 10, 51, 58, 78, and 102 bombing squadrons. By the end of September, a 6th squadron, number 77, was being organised around the Mark V Whitleys that had become available, though it would take a little longer for them to receive their full complement. The majority of these Whitleys were operated under the overall command of No. 4 Bomb Group, which, at the time, under the command of Sir Arthur Conningham, was the only bombing force in the world specifically trained for nighttime operations. Though the number of Whitleys in service was modest, many more were now on order. In addition to the original contract for 312 Mark Vs, a further order for 150 was placed in early 1939, and, following the outbreak of war, this number was further increased so that just over 1,000 were on order by the spring of 1940. As far as its wartime service went, the Whitley had a distinguished career that was busy from the outset. It was the first RAF aircraft to breach German airspace. On the first night of the war, 10 Whitley Mark III's from 51 and 58 bombing squadrons were sent over the cities of Hamburg and Bremen, as well as the Ruhr Valley. Their mission involved dropping around 13 tonnes of material, but none of it was explosive. Instead, they dispersed 5.5 million propaganda leaflets, marking the beginning of numerous sorties under Operation Nickel. This operation followed a strict government mandate to avoid bombing the German mainland, motivated by the fear of Luftwaffe retaliation. At the time, there was a prevalent belief that Germany possessed a more formidable ability to devastate British cities, a notion seemingly supported by the events unfolding in Poland. Interestingly, despite being outnumbered, the RAF actually held the upper hand in bombing capabilities when you compared the designs fielded by both sides individually. The Whitley could carry a heavier payload than any of the German frontline bombers fielded at the time, and the Wellington was on par with most of them. But despite the superiority, the Whitley would not engage in direct bombing attacks for the first few months of the war, instead adhering to the more passive approach of the Nickel raids. Though the effects of these raids were mostly negligible, it did allow air crews to build up valuable operating experience. Although they rarely encountered enemy interceptors in these early months of the war, these missions were not without their risks. Several Whitleys were written off in takeoff and landing accidents at night, mostly due to inexperienced pilots, and the winter of 1939 to 1940 was particularly cold and came with some appalling weather. It was a combination of poor weather and inexperience that put one Whitley crew through a particularly interesting ordeal. By March of 1940, Whitleys were now being used on regular bombing sorties, but the leaflet dropping missions also continued. On the night of the 15th, one of the most ambitious yet saw Whitley Mark Vs from No. 77 Squadron fly from their bases in northern France to drop leaflets over occupied Warsaw. One of these was flown by Flight Lieutenant B. Tomlin and his crew, Pilot Officer T. Parrott, Sergeant Charlton, Corporal Perry, and Aircraftsman Ericsson. Following a successful leaflet drop over Warsaw, they encountered particularly bad weather and had to stray quite far from their planned return route to avoid it. At this early juncture, nighttime navigation was mostly a case of dead reckoning, using heading, speed, landmarks and the stars, and after one or two concerning interludes when they thought they were lost, the crew finally made it over friendly territory. Descending to find a landing place, Tomlin's Whitley unexpectedly came under anti-aircraft fire. Believing the French had mistaken him for a roving German reconnaissance aircraft, Tomlin switched on the navigation lights and lowered the undercarriage. This obvious sign that he was about to land silenced the guns, as only a fool would land in enemy territory, and Tomlin brought the bomber down for a somewhat bumpy landing in a field. As it turned out, he was the fool. After the Whitley's engines had shut down, Tomlin and his crew caught sight of a young man running across the field to greet them, presumably a local French farmer. After climbing out to greet said Frenchman, Tomlin was rather shocked to find the youth was speaking in very obvious and very fluent German, 
and they quickly learned that they had landed 30 miles on the wrong side of the Franco-German border. Tomlin and his co-pilot then bolted back into the Whitley, fired up the engines, which mercifully started on the first attempt, powered down the field, clipped a low-lying hedge, and pretty much held their breath as they crossed the Siegfried line at a perilously low altitude, an event made even more disconcerting by the Whitley's requirements to have its nose pointed down for it to stay level. Mercifully, Tomlin's good luck continued, and his Whitley eventually touched down safely at Villeneuve, where they made doubly sure that the first person to approach them was indeed French. As mentioned before, by the time of Tomlin's accidental five-man invasion of southern Germany, the Whitley was now being used in its intended role. The first offensive action by Whitley's occurred on the night of the 12th to the 13th of December 1939. Their bombs were not directed at a land target, but were instead aimed at mine-laying seaplanes that were taking off from the Berkham Air Station in the Frisian Islands. It would not be for another three months until bombs were actually dropped on a land target intentionally, with the Hernham seaplane base being hit by Whitley's on the night of March the 19th. Unlike the Vickers Wellington and Hanley Page Hampton, which began the war operating as day bombers, the Whitley was used exclusively at night. Because of this, Whitley squadrons were spared the heavy casualties incurred during the early daylight raids, and losses during these attacks were comparatively small. But like with the Wellington and the Hampton, the Whitley would see its most active period begin when Germany launched its Blitzkrieg against Belgium, France and Holland in May. Within hours of the invasion commencing, Whitley's from No. 77 and 102 squadrons dropped the first bombs on the German mainland, targeting railway stations along the German lines of supply. This was followed the next night by an even larger raid, again against German lines of supply, but three days later the political restrictions imposed on Bomber Command were lifted, and the RAF immediately began more aggressive targeting of German infrastructure and production facilities. A month later, Whitley's would also carry out the first air raid against Italy during Operation Haddock. On the night of the 11th to the 12th of June, 36 Whitley's from numbers 10, 51, 58, 77 and 102 Squadron took off to bomb targets located in Turin and Genoa. Vickers Wellingtons were also meant to take part in the opening phases of this operation, but at the last moment, they were not allowed to take off from their bases on the French mainland. The Whitleys, with their longer range, were able to take off from their airfields in England, refuelled at bases on the Channel Islands of Jersey and Guernsey, and then went on towards their targets. The success of this mission was somewhat marred by poor weather, which meant that only 13 aircraft actually reached their targets, but nonetheless, the Whitley had claimed another aria first in the ever-escalating air war. This escalation soon saw the first bombs to be dropped on Berlin, a raid in which the Whitley flew alongside Hamdens and Wellingtons on the night of the 25th to the 26th of August 1940. From that point on, the Whitley and the Wellington would carry out the majority of raids into German territory for the next 12 months, until in late 1941, when the first of the newer and heavier four engine bombers were beginning to enter service. These early bombing raids were nothing compared to the massed assaults that would begin in 1942 and 1943. They were also incredibly inaccurate. In the 12 months between August of 1940 and 1941, it was estimated that over 50% of all bombs dropped landed in open fields rather than on the roofs of factories, railways or dockyards. But despite having a minor impact as far as strategic bombing went, the Whitley did play a vital role in training many of the bomber crews that would go on to serve in its successors. On the whole, the Whitley was well liked, and it was considered almost completely viceless. Despite being operated as a night bomber, the accident rate of Whitley's was no worse than for the other aircraft in Bomber Command, and indeed in some squadrons it was comparatively less. It also proved to be remarkably rugged, thanks to the new construction methods used in its fuselage. Many Whitleys returned from bombing raids with large chunks of the fuselage blown away, either by flak or cannon fire, and others, which had suffered damage to their hydraulics, were able to shrug off the harsh impact of a wheels-up landing without having the entire airframe written off. 
This ability to absorb damage allowed the Whitley to preserve many airmen who would go on to serve important roles within Bomber Command and the RAF in general. Don Bennett, who would go on to lead No. 8 Group, the famous Pathfinder Force, gained early experience in heavy bombers with the Whitley, as did Leonard Cheshire, who began his career in a Whitley of 102 Squadron, and who would eventually go on to become one of the RAF's most decorated pilots, earning the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Distinguished Service Order with two bars, the Order of Merit, and the Victoria Cross. It was in Whitley, in fact, that he would earn the Distinguished Service Order. On the night of the 12th to the 13th of November 1940, his Whitley was part of a raid on a synthetic oil plant near Cologne. At the drop point, poor weather obscured the target, so he decided to go and strike a nearby railway yard instead. On the approach, two flak shells exploded almost simultaneously next to his Whitley, one of which tore a hole in the aircraft's side and ignited a signal flare. Cheshire himself was temporarily blinded as the other shell had burst directly above the cockpit, but he eventually recovered his senses just in time as the aircraft had entered an uncontrolled dive. He was able to level out at 5,000 feet, and by the time the crew had put the fire out, they had wandered deep into German territory. But as the aircraft was mostly intact, aside from a giant hole, and as the engine still worked, and the bomb bay was still full, Cheshire decided to go back for another run on the railway yard. Despite now being the only Allied bomber in the area, and thus having to withstand the full concentrated fury of the local flak batteries, the crew got their bombs off successfully, and Cheshire got his bomber and crew safely back to England. Cheshire's story was one of many that was a testament to the Whitley's reliability. But the Whitley's ruggedness wasn't just tested by the enemy. A good number were also used by operational training units, and some of which were involved in some rather spectacular accidents. One Whitley in particular was subjected to a very unfortunate fate of having an Avro Anson land on top of it. This occurred during a nighttime exercise, with the Anson's pilot having mistaken the airfield controller's signal, and thus giving the crew of the Whitley, who were in the process of taking off, a sudden desire for a new set of trousers, as the twin-engine training aircraft landed on its back. Though this particular Whitley was written off from giving the Anson its unexpected piggyback, it had not severely buckled under the weight and the force of the impact, and the crew reported no injuries whatsoever. As the months rolled on, it would in fact be with these operational training units and other commands in which the Whitley would complete much of its wartime service, as it would be phased out of frontline bombing operations rather quickly. Though just as effective in its missions as the Vickers Wellington, the Whitley was retired far sooner due to its class. As a heavy bomber, its life was always destined to be short, as plans for larger four-engine aircraft were already in motion before it had even entered service. The short Sterling became operational in early 1941, and it was soon followed by the Hanley Page Halifax, and then a year later by the Avro Lancaster. Because of this, the Whitley's last official operation with Bomber Command took place on the night of the 29th to the 30th of April 1942, though some were later drafted from various training units to pad out the numbers of Harris's 1000 bomber raid on Cologne the following month. Though it was no longer a frontline bomber, the Whitley's wartime service was far from over, and in fact, it had already been serving diligently in a number of auxiliary roles. At the start of the war, No. 58 Squadron was temporarily transferred from Bomber Command to Coastal Command, who was scrambling to bolster the number of aircraft available for anti-submarine missions and general patrols. 58 Squadron was not there for very long, transferring back to Bomber Command in 1940, but the Whitley had proved reliable for nighttime patrols, and soon other units were transferred over. Other squadrons that found themselves spending time at Coastal Command included No. 502 Squadron, assigned to Northern Ireland, No. 612 Squadron, assigned to Iceland, and No. 77 Squadron, which was assigned to Devon. Additionally, No. 58 Squadron would return to Coastal Command on a permanent basis in 1942, but they would then exchange their Whitleys for the Hanley Page Halifax. 
It was a Whitley from that squadron, assisted by other Coastal Command units, that scored the type's first U-boat kill when it sank U-705 in the Bay of Biscay on September 3rd, 1941. To begin with, these squadrons operated the standard Whitley, the Mark V, but their success with Coastal Command led to the development of a more specialised version known as the Mark VII. As an aside, a Mark VI Whitley bomber had been planned, powered by Pratt & Whitney engines in case Merlins were in short supply, but this aircraft never eventuated. Upgrades found in the Mark VII consisted of extra fuel tanks in the bomb bay and the rear fuselage, which increased total capacity to 1,100 gallons for a range of 2,300 miles, and there was also the installation of the ASV Mark II air-to-surface radar. With its complementary stickleback aerials, this made the Mark VII very easy to distinguish, and the operator of which also increased the total crew complement to six. Unfortunately, these changes did have a negative impact on performance, as there was no change to the power plant. The gross weight went up to just under 34,000 pounds, and the drag-inducing aerials reduced the top speed to 215 miles an hour. Additionally, the aircraft could no longer sustain altitude on a single engine, which necessitated extra training for bailout procedures at sea. In total, just over 146 Mark 7s would be built, and they joined Coastal Command in the later half of 1941, gradually replacing the Mark 5s in use, though some of those were actually converted over to Mark 7 specifications. It was here that the Whitley earned another distinction, as it was the first aircraft to enter service with the ASV Mark II radar, and it soon proved itself invaluable for maritime patrols, particularly at night. These long-range patrols were not without their dangers, both from the enemy and the unpredictable weather, and losses were frequent. A Whitley unit used for anti-submarine duties, and maintained by No. 10 Bomber Operational Training Unit, lost 35 aircraft in the 12 months between July of 1942 and 43. During this time, they flew some 35 sorties each week, and accounted for one submarine sunk and four others damaged. Though the Whitley performed well in the maritime patrol role, harassing enemy submarines and protecting vital shipping routes, its lack of engine power meant that its time with Coastal Command was relatively short. At the end of 1943, most Whitleys were retired from the command, and they were being replaced by the Wellington Mark VIII. But, yet again, this did not mark the end of the Whitley's wartime career. Another role in which the Whitley found use was that of a transport and trainer for Britain's new and rapidly expanding airborne assault units. In the summer of 1940, Winston Churchill initiated an ambitious plan to form a corps of 5,000 paratroopers, with recruitment and training to begin immediately. Until that time, little attention had been given to airborne forces on a large scale in Britain, although it was known that development in this field was well advanced in both Germany and the Soviet Union. Now, with Britain cut off from the rest of Europe following the fall of France, this lack of development was being keenly felt. Selecting the right aircraft for training these new paratroopers proved to be a considerable challenge, there simply weren't enough aircraft available for training such numbers or for such specialised missions, and it was a case of cobbling together whatever they could find. Ultimately, it was the Whitley that was chosen thanks to its ample size. Six Mark II versions of the aircraft were swiftly modified for the task. As initially planned, paratroopers were given two exit points within the Whitley. One through a circular hatch, complete with split doors, which was located where the ventral turret once was, and another via a platform at the very end of the tail, which took the place of the rear gun turret. The first test drops by RAF parachute instructors took place on July the 16th, 1940, and just one week later, the first formal training flights carrying paratroopers would begin. The method of deploying troops from the aircraft's tail was quickly deemed impractical. Not only did it subject the paratroopers to extreme winds prior to their jump, but it also stripped the Whitley of its only form of rear defence. That being said, the alternative method of exit was not without its own set of complications either. As mentioned before, the Whitley was designed to hold 10 paratroopers, with 5 forward and 5 aft of this floor hatch. 
Precision and timing was critical in the drop, as any miscalculation and the slipstream could drag a paratrooper across the hatch's edge, inflicting a nasty facial injury that became known as the Whitley's Kiss. Moreover, those positioned aft had to jump facing the slipstream, which could send them tumbling violently, sometimes colliding with the aircraft itself, causing injury, or worse, damaging their parachutes with potentially lethal outcomes. Along with these challenges, it was soon realised that the objective of fielding 5,000 paratroops would never be met in time using just the Whitley as the main transport. By late 1940, Bomber Command had put a large number at the airborne unit's disposal, including most of the old Mark 1s, 2s and 3s. But even if the entirety of Bomber Command's number 4 group was committed to the task, only 700 out of these 5,000 paratroops could ever be deployed in a single day. This quickly resulted in a decision to develop troop-carrying gliders, such as the airspeed Horsa, and to use the Whitley instead as the towing aircraft. But before this new scheme was sufficiently developed, Whitleys were still used to carry British troops into action. The aircraft's first combat drop took place on the night of February the 10th to the 11th, 1941. Following a month of specialised training, eight Whitleys took off from Malta with 37 men aboard. The mission, codenamed Operation Colossus, aimed to destroy the aqueduct at Trigino in Italy. Though the aqueduct was destroyed, a series of complications meant that the entire force was captured by the Italians, bar one killed in action, and the damage from the attack was quickly repaired. Nevertheless, the mission served as an excellent morale boost, demonstrating that with refinements, the airborne units could go on to do great damage. This was proven 12 months later with Operation Biting, a highly successful raid on a German radar installation at Brunval in northern France. On the night of the 27th of February 1941, Whitley's from No. 51 Squadron carried a company of 120 airborne troops into action. They were successfully dropped at the target, assaulted and captured the radar installation, disassembled it to take away key parts, and were then successfully evacuated from a nearby beach by units of the Royal Navy. Though a complete success, that raid would be the last time that the Whitley saw major use as a troop transport, as by this time its career as a glider tug had already begun, though in truth its time in this role would be just as brief. Some aircraft initially flew without the rear turret, like with the earlier troop transport version, but this didn't last for long either, owing to concerns about a total lack of defence for the aircraft's rear. Towing trials were undertaken at RE Farnborough, and these included tests with twin tows of two gliders, but for normal operations, the main intent was for the Whitley to tow just one glider at a time. Though the glider trials were successful, and during 1942, Number 38 Group built up a wealth of experience, the Whitley was mostly replaced as a glider tug by the time that they would actually be towed into action, with the four-engine Hanley Page Halifax taking its place. This was mostly because the Hanley Page Halifax was capable of towing the newer, larger, and heavier Hamilcar glider, which the Whitley could not and like the Hanley Page Hampton and the Vickers Wellington, the Whitley was now rapidly becoming a victim of its pre-war age. By this point, it had served in roles far outside its original design scope, and along with serving as a bomber, a coastal patrol aircraft, a troop transport and a glider tug, the Whitley was also involved in its fair share of experimental and research programs as well. Back in 1937, the original prototype Whitley had been flown to RAE Farnborough for a series of loaded runway tests. The goal of these experiments was to determine the requirements for the new paved runways that were planned for RAF airfields. The Whitley was operational from grass fields at a weight of 22,000 pounds, but the new heavy bombers then in the design stage were expected to weigh upwards of 40,000 pounds and possibly exceed a gross weight of 53,000. The thought of unveiling a new, highly advanced series of heavy bombers, and then finding that they sank into newly laid runways was, of course, not a pleasant one to contemplate, and so the Whitley prototype was modified to simulate the weight of these new designs so that various services could be tested. 
The Whitley's new bulking diet consisted of heavy steel beams, which were attached to the underside in stages, gradually bringing up the all-up weight. As an equivalent increase in engine power was not made, these experiments were limited to static tests or taxiing runs. This culminated with tests at the end of 1939, with the Whitley simulating an empty weight of 40,000 pounds, or basically double its original design. And remarkably, these tests showed that an aircraft of this weight class could actually operate from grass runways without much difficulty. Although there was the slight issue of the wheels cleaving six inch deep furrows in said grass, which presented something of a challenge if you wanted to use the runway more than once. Along with temporarily becoming England's largest and heaviest field plough, the Whitley also put in many hours in high altitude equipment tests, some of which were carried out at a considerable risk. One incident involved a Mark III Whitley flown by John Grierson, who was a test pilot for Armstrong Sidley Motors. He had taken the aircraft up for a prolonged test of new carburetors at 18,000 feet, and the flight had taken so long that he had been forced to ration his oxygen supply. This was perhaps not the wisest decision to be taken by somebody in charge of a large aircraft, and by the end of the test, Grierson was, though he didn't know it yet, suffering from oxygen starvation. Oxygen starvation tends to impair one's judgement, and the result was that when it came time to descend from 18,000 feet, Grierson forgot about the altitude and its subsequent lack of thin air, and he put the aircraft into a sharp turn, which promptly stalled. The Whitley then fell out of the sky like a brick, diving with its nose pointing directly at the ground and causing the airspeed indicator to go completely off the scale. Both of the engines then oversped, with the port engine disassembling itself in spectacular fashion, and Grierson was alarmed to hear what sounded distinctly like sections of the airframe tearing loose. He was then promptly deafened as the nose hatch blew in from the pressure and it sent cold air screeching all the way through the cabin. Eventually, half deaf and half frozen, Grierson was able to recover the Whitley from its dive and, with fresh oxygen feeding his brain, he was able to nurse the half-wrecked plane back to base, with the test proving to be a better indicator of the Whitley's ruggedness over anything else. Yet another area of research in which the Whitley found use was that of power plant development. In order to compete with the high-powered Rolls-Royce Merlin, Armstrong Sidley was designing a 21-cylinder air-cooled radial, with the cylinders arranged in three rows and in line, and with each line having an overhead camshaft. Named the Deerhound, this very compact engine was tested in 1936 and produced 1,115 horsepower, with expectations that this would soon rise to over 1,500. This engine made its first flight in a modified Whitley Mark II during the first week of January in 1939. It featured a reverse flow cooling system. Cooling air entered through a scoop underneath the spinner, and it was ducted back to the rear of the engine first. Unfortunately, this system was not yet perfected, and the engine repeatedly suffered from problems from overheating. This was made worse by inadequate cooling fins on the engine itself, but an updated replacement engine, which showed much promise, was never tested, as the aircraft and the engines were destroyed in a crash in March of 1940. The cause of the accident was not the engine itself, but an incorrect setting of the tail trim that led to a loss of control. The tail trimming device on the Whitley was very strong, a side effect of the aircraft's unusual wing design and flight profile, and the position indicator for this device was not always easily legible. This had led to several incidents, and one very serious accident in the past, where the trim had been set incorrectly, and although this problem was later addressed, the accident had played its part in terminating the development of the Deerhound engine, though the onset of the war also played a part as well. Following its withdrawal as a bomber, and the other roles already mentioned, the Whitley's time during the rest of the war could be split into three categories – training, transport, and the occasional bit of research. A good number of Whitleys were used by the operational training units, helping to train air crews who would go on into the larger four-engine heavies, 
but a few found themselves flying as civil aircraft for the British Overseas Aircraft Corporation. In total, 15 Mark V Whitleys would be converted into freighters, the gun turrets would be removed and fared over, and the bomb bays were modified to carry extra fuel tanks, which increased the operational range to 2,500 miles. These civil Whitleys carried full registrations and were flown by BOAC crews. Initially, they flew a regular route from Britain to West Africa, but in mid-1942 they were reassigned to the Mediterranean. Between April and August of that year, they took off from Gibraltar to fly desperately needed supplies to the island of Malta. The seven-hour flight was especially dangerous, and the risk was threefold. The aircraft was so heavily laden that they could not stay aloft on just the one engine, they often had to land at Malta in poor weather, poor lighting, or both, and during the approach to Malta, and indeed during landing itself sometimes, they often came under fierce enemy fighter attack, which was more than a little inconvenient as the aircraft was now without its defensive gun turrets. In spite of the considerable danger, no Whitleys were lost during these supply flights, and after running the Malta gauntlet by night for five months, the Whitley freighters were then transferred to an equally nocturnal, equally dangerous transport route further north. Taking off from Scotland, they would fly to Stockholm and bring back urgently needed supplies of Swedish ball bearings. However, these missions did not last for particularly long. Firstly, they lacked the performance to even think of evading German fighters based in Norway, and secondly, the Whitley's relatively poor fuel consumption meant that they couldn't carry a great deal of cargo. Within less than a month, they were replaced by the de Havilland Mosquitoes, and the Whitleys were gradually handed back to the RAF over the next six months, thus ending the Whitleys' brief civil career. It was now a career that would be spent almost exclusively in training and transport squadrons for the rest of the war, for as a military aircraft, it had been formally declared obsolete in early 1944. Production of the Armstrong Whitworth Whitley had ended earlier in July of 1943. By that time, 1,814 aircraft had been built, making it the company's most prolific and successful design, and one which set many aviation firsts for the RAF. Before the war, the Whitley squadrons represented the world's first fully trained night bomber force. It became the first service aircraft to make use of two-speed superchargers, and although already becoming obsolete by September of 1939, it formed the cornerstone of Britain's bombing offensives during the first years of the Second World War. Despite being overshadowed by its contemporaries, it was the Whitley that carried out the first leaflet raids, it was the first to make bombing attacks on mainland Germany, and it was the first to cross the Alps and attack targets in mainland Italy. Unfortunately, no examples of this venerable but underappreciated aircraft survive today. Like some other early war designs, none were kept aside for preservation. Sections of various Whitleys have been salvaged and preserved in piecemeal, and there have been on and off attempts to rebuild a Whitley from these remains, but nothing has yet fully eventuated. One of the last Whitleys to be built, registered LA-951, was still flying in 1949, yet it too was broken down for materials, despite being in very good condition and having seen no hard service, something which made it an ideal museum candidate from the point of upkeep. This aircraft had been kept by the company for a rather special job. It was to be used as a tug for the AW-52G, which was a prototype glider that was used to test the design principles of the AW-52, which was a turbojet flying wing. This highly advanced aircraft would take to the skies just 11 years after the prototype Whitley's maiden flight, and it stands as an excellent example of the rapid pace of aircraft development during this period. And it stands as an excellent testament to the Whitley as well an aircraft that began its career halfway to being obsolete, but one that still managed to do itself credit. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the Patreon supporters. It's been a while since I've done one of these deep dive videos, so I hope it was worth the wait, and I hope the audio quality is okay as well because I had to re-record entire sections
of this video because I'm not used for, I'm not used to talking for so long anymore. I need to get back into the swing of it. But uh, good news is that there are more deep dives planned for the very near future, and I'm hoping to release some soon, time and editing permitting. A big thank you, of course, to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier members. And for those who are interested, I am planning to do some sort of live stream in the semi-near future. I'm just finishing off one or two things in the office, and we will be good to go. So stand by for more information on that later on. But as always, thank you all so much for your continued support, and I will catch you all next time. Goodbye.